So at any rate, uh, I do have in the slides my contact information in case anybody wants to get a hold of me. Uh, my one person company is Cousin IT Incorporated, or as my wife calls it, Cousin It. So, you know, that way you can remember. Uh, at any rate, there's an a email address and a blog and a Twitter account. And of course, I'm an older white male. So of course, I have a newsletter. So there you go. Uh, the only reason I put the books up here is because I wanted to point out that I have a background in Kotlin and Java and Groovy, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I've been working with all these languages and I was driven to use Kotlin basically because it's the definitive language for Android now. And it's also used as a DSL inside of Gradle. And the fact that Spring also supports Kotlin so well just turned out to be a bonus in the long run. So that's really very helpful to me. All right. Now, I have several links here, and I have all of these pages already open, but the only thing I need to point out to you right now is the GitHub repository that contains all the code I'm going to show you is in my own GitHub account. So it's github.com slash my last name, K-O-U-S-E-N, uh, slash spring dash Kotlin. And there's multiple projects under there, and I'm going to show you pieces out of several of them. So Spring Boot and Spring both have separate documentation pages on their Kotlin support, and I'll show you those. And it's typical of Spring to, to show things in the core and then to show how Spring Boot simplified or refined it or added new features to it. There's also a very nice tutorial of using Spring and Kotlin together as part of the Spring IO guides as well. So I have several uh, features open here, and I'll get to those as we go along. So one thing to point out right off the bat is that when you use Spring and Kotlin together, Kotlin provides a challenge to Spring because Spring does a lot of its work by building proxies, by extending classes and then creating their own subclass and then calling super and all that kind of stuff. And with Kotlin, the, the language is statically bound by default, meaning that you cannot extend any classes unless they have the keyword open on them. And this is a problem. I mean, the fact that you cannot extend anything unless it's marked for that is, is a, a limitation for as far as Spring is concerned. So there is a plugin for, from Spring that actually is used to open the classes that it needs to extend in order to make the proxies we need. Anything annotated with component, which also means things like service and controller and rest controller, and anything marked with that transactional as well as the others are all automatically opened and that really makes life much, much simpler. There's another plugin that also gets added basically a JPA plugin that will automatically add no argument constructors to entity classes. Now, I'm gonna get into the details here, but let me just show you right off the bat. This is of course the, the Spring Initializer. And if I was to select Kotlin as the default language here, you could see you could pick a version and everything. And if I just add a couple of dependencies like web, and of course I think I want uh, reactive web as well, and JPA for example, and the actuator um, here, then I don't actually want to generate it. I just want to show you what the build file looks like. And the fact that I selected Kotlin as a development language means that the build file is using the Kotlin DSL, even inside of Gradle. And you can see the various plugins, the normal Spring Boot plugin and the dependency management plugin, as well as the Kotlin dependency. And there are those two plugins I was telling you about, the plugin from Spring and the plugin for JPA. The rest of this is just typical dependencies, although I have added in with the features I added in, in addition to the actuator and the data JPA and web and web flux, you see there's a special Jackson module that works with the RESTful web services to serialize and deserialize classes into uh, Kotlin, well, either data classes or regular classes, we'll talk about that. I also here am adding in some reactor Kotlin extensions and reflection and coroutines and all this stuff. So I'm not actually going to use this project. I just wanted to show you that the act of generating a project with the spring initializer using Kotlin as the default language sets up all these additional features. And that's really nice because that means you don't have to do that. Now, I'm also going to take advantage of the fact that we're using Spring Boot 
uh, pardon me, J unit five. Uh, of course, as you're probably aware, in the last few versions of Spring Boot, the Spring Boot test annotation includes an extension from uh, Spring so that now you can use J unit five automatically inside there. There was a question, by the way, quickly that said, well, what's the recommended Kotlin dependency to build the app using JDK 11? Uh, I recommend using the standard live for JDK 8. I don't think Kotlin does anything any different if you go above 8, but I do recommend using something with 8 or above. The, at least take advantage of the underlying bytecodes that understand things about uh, lambdas and streams and method references. Now, one thing about JUnit 5 is that uh, let me say it this way. In Kotlin, they don't have a static keyword. So the way they emulate static behavior is to have top level functions, as we'll see, and also things like companion objects. These are features that are largely borrowed from Scala, for example. And in JUnit 5, you can change the life cycle of your tests so that rather than reinstantiating the test between each the test class between each individual test, you can say just one test per class. And this way you can, uh, you don't have to have static methods for your before all and your after all mechanisms. You can actually create a little file here under source test resources called junitplatform.properties, add this line to it, and that'll be the default behavior throughout the rest. So I'm just mentioning this because that's what I've put into the repository. Now, one of the neat features about Kotlin is the ability to add extension functions to existing classes. You can wind up adding new capabilities to classes that already exist. Now that, of course, it's the, the Spider-Man corollary, you know, with great power comes great responsibility there. You have to be a little careful what you do, but the advantage from our point of view, from a developer point of view, is that Spring has already added many extension functions to what the Java libraries that we're accustomed to using. So this actually simplifies life in a, in a big way. Now, as a trivial example of this, if you ever make a Spring MVC app, you're familiar with the model interface. Now, the model interface, of course, is Java. So this interface is used to carry information from one resource on the server side to another, say from a controller to a view. And what's interesting is they have added a function called set, which is actually an operator function to the model. And the idea here is that the set function just turns around and invokes add attribute. And this means that if you're using a model object, you can use the array type syntax to assign values. And effectively, this is just turning around and invoking add attribute. So as a simple example, example here, I have a hello world type of controller in one of my applications. And in this controller, my say hello method here includes an argument of type model. So that's use lowercase model of type capital model. And notice that the set function as an extension function needs to be imported, interestingly enough. But once you do that, you can go ahead and simply use this equals mechanism to add an attribute to the model. Another couple of Kotlin things that are going on here, by the way, the question mark here indicates that name is nullable. Spring interprets that to mean that it is not a required parameter. So that if you don't have a question mark in, in Kotlin, that means that the var variable can never be null. And Spring adds to that, that the variable is also required. Now I've explicitly stated that it's not required and given a default value, but you can see how this works. Now, there's a simple unit test for this, which is again, using the life cycle per class. And I don't have to do that if I set in a different project, I set that overall uh, file that I mentioned before, but here I can state it explicitly. And I can take advantage of JUnit 5 syntax to work with an assert all here, for example. So uh, testing the say hello without a name, uh, again, if you're not familiar with Kotlin, this allows you to instantiate classes without the keyword new. So Kotlin doesn't use the word new, you just invoke a constructor here. And I've instantiated a couple classes, invoke the method directly, and I can check using the Lambda syntax in Kotlin that the properties are all correct as they should be in both of these cases. Also in Kotlin, you can use in your tests these back ticks in order to put in a descriptive statement for what the test is trying to accomplish. That's another neat little feature. 
Now, one of the other really nice things in Kotlin is the ability to create what they call domain-specific languages. Now, creating a DSL is just as hard as creating any other system, or, or maybe I should say it this way, it's easy to create a bad DSL, if you will. However, the, the core team has added a few very convenient DSLs to Kotlin. And in this particular case, what I have here is a mock MVC test. So this test here is taking advantage of a DSL provided by Spring for doing mock MVC tests. So the first thing to notice is that the class reference uses a double colon, which, okay, fine, in web MVC test. And you can auto wire into a constructor inside of Kotlin here. So I'm auto wiring a mock MVC object into this constructor. And then I have my two tests again, but notice how the DSL is making it simpler to write what looks like a test that we are driving, you know, that, that looks like we're driving a system programmatically. So from the mock MVC object, I'm invoking a get request at this URL. This accept part is underlined because this is a, if you can see it here, a var type, if you see there, meaning that it can be modified and it's a nullable media type. So I set it to whatever I want to set it to. And then I can expect status is okay. This is okay is one of the standard result matchers and actually invokes the method for the 200. It tells me the view has a name of hello and the model has an attribute of type uh, called user whose value is world. And down here I have pretty much the same thing, except that I supplied a, a query parameter as part of the URL and plugged everything in there as well. So this is one of the neat features of Kotlin that Spring takes advantage of is the ability to write a DSL, a domain specific language. And one of the DSLs that comes with Spring is this mock MVC DSL. And it's pretty well documented as well. Now, moving to a RESTful web service, here is a RESTful service, and this is showing another couple of features of Kotlin. One is that I have, in this case, a function whose entire implementation is a single statement. Basically, I created a class called greeting, and in fact, you can see it right here, which shows another feature of Kotlin. You can actually put multiple classes in the same file. Now, I typically don't do that with uh, controllers and data classes, but it is common to put multiple data classes in a file together when you're doing, say, a JSON decomposition, and I'm going to be getting to that a little later. I just thought I'd show it here as an interesting feature. So this one is showing that the implementation of the greet function, if you will, let me make that full screen, is to simply instantiate the greet class, the greeting class, pardon me, with this name or the message where we're using string interpolation. Whatever name was supplied as an argument either came in on a query parameter or if there's none, the default value is world. This creates the string, hello, whatever that name is, instantiates the class, and then returns it automatically with this equal sign. So you see, this isn't anything you couldn't do in Java. It's just a lot simpler, a lot cleaner, if you will. And this is your standard REST controller. Nothing really unusual there. So to test a REST controller, I have a couple of different mechanisms. Here's one. And this, again, is using Kotlin. But this time, I'm going to use the test REST template. And the test rest template is another class that Spring has decided to enhance with some extension functions to make it easier to work, easier to work with, pardon me. So the idea here is I'm going to do a true integration test where I'm going to deploy this application to a server running on a random port. And if you auto wire in an instance of test rest template, then that is automatically configured to work with that random port. You don't have to do anything special with it. So let me start with this one down here. If I say greet with the name Dolly should return hello Dolly, then this get for object function, which you may be familiar with from the REST template, now has this generic type written on it, greeting, and I only have to put in the URL. See, if you're used to using the Java version of this, it would take a URL and then a comma, and then it would say something like greeting.class to say what we're getting back. In Kotlin, they have what they call reified types, 
that can actually preserve the type information during the compilation process. It's not erased the way it is in Java. So this get for object of type greeting automatically returns the greeting uh, from the, 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 actually the response from the controller is a JSON object. This deserializes it into a greeting instance. Of course, it's a nullable greeting. And then I have to, if I want to access the message off of it, I use what they call the safe call operator question mark dot. That basically says, is it not null? Then access it. Otherwise it would return null. And that's how I'm checking my quality. Now, if I want the actual container, the wrapper around this, then you could call get for entity instead. Now I have a response entity of type greeting, which means I could access features like the status code, or I could go into the headers and get the content type. This is another Kotlin idiom that comes up frequently in development, and it's kind of a neat one. The question mark dot here says, okay, if it's not null, let's do whatever's in this block. That's how I interpret it. The let function says, execute this block here, which says, let's assert that the media type is in fact application JSON. But then we have the Elvis operator, as they call it, which came from Groovy, that says, if this was null, then fail saying the content type header was not correct or, or absent or whatever message you want to put in there. This combination of the safe call with a lead and an Elvis as the alternative is a really powerful one. And then of course, once I've gone through that, I can just check the message once again. So it's just some nice features of Kotlin that make it a little bit cleaner to write more elaborate tests here. Okay, going back to the uh, slides for a moment. So I mentioned Kotlin makes it easy to define these domain specific languages and Spring does include a bean definition DSL. I have actually not really needed that much. I, I know you can use it for Spring itself, but for Spring Boot, my, I'm perfectly happy to work with things based on the Java config approach. And I've been fine with that using the at configuration annotation and at bean, I haven't really needed the bean definition DSL, but you saw that mock MVC DSL is very helpful. There's also a router DSL if you're using the reactive streams, I'll show something with that later. Okay, so here was an example of the mock MVC DSL with the status and the view and the model. And there's an example actually of the router DSL. In case I don't show you an example of it, you can see this is creating a bean that will occupy the application context. You know, this is a configuration file and this main router is assigned to, and they have a, an actual method called router that takes as an argument a Lambda. And you see how you could script out how you want the URLs to match up with handler functions. If we accept text HTML and then inside there, if we're going to slash, then we say return okay and render index. If it's users, then we go to the user handler, which was injected here and invoke find all view. And if we go into slash API, then we can work our way through that as well. So this is an example I actually took directly from the spring documentation. I don't have that one implemented. I just thought I'd show you a, a nice little system there. So once again, we have a DSL for building our little router function, which is kind of makes the whole functional endpoints approach a little bit more appealing. Now, one of the places that the reified generic shows up, I didn't actually show you. Let me go back here. And if I look at the demo application itself, you see that the, the class here actually doesn't even have braces after it. In fact, this is an empty class. It has nothing in it except for the annotation Spring Boot application. This main function is what they call a top level function in Kotlin, which means if you're thinking Java, it's static which of course we expect main to be, public, static, void, main, et cetera. So there's our main function with our array of strings as our arguments. And they have added this function, this function which takes a, returns a reified T here, which is, uh, takes a variable argument list of args. And again, there's the application itself and there's the spread operator associated with the arguments. And this is the normal main method we get in any typical Spring Boot application. Just wanted to illustrate that. One other thing I thought I'd throw in, I have the REST controller test that I showed you. I also decided to show that with the web test client as well. So if you are not fond of the 
regular old REST template, you can still use web test or the web client here. And once again, we have an example where they have added an extension function with a generic type in it. So that once we say, go to this URI, exchange the data, expect the status is okay, the content type header is JSON, and then expect the body to, to include a greeting, and then I can extract the body and get the message out of it and check the value on it. And this consume with would take a normal consumer from Java, here I'm providing a Lambda expression to do the same thing. So this one looks almost the same as the Java implementation would look with a couple of slight simplifications in there, but once again, taking advantage of the reified types inside there. Okay, now they did point out, I didn't actually use this, I just thought I'd include it in the slides, that if you want to initialize your application, there, Colin includes things called scope functions like apply or run and what apply does is it says after you've instantiated a class see this again is the constructor just don't have a word new there after you've instantiated the class then apply says do whatever initialization was provided and the init here is a lambda expression it says give me a lambda that takes no arguments and returns void unit is kotlin for void and go ahead and apply it to this object and then run the application with the provided arguments so again this is a feature from kotlin that spring is able to take advantage of okay now one of the really neat things about kotlin is the use of data classes kotlin basically makes POJOs, if you will, from Java. But once you put the data keyword on there, then you get getters and setters. Well, I don't have any setters because these are all val types, so they're final. But I also get a two string method, an equals method, a hash code method, and a handful of other methods that are really convenient for Kotlin. But where these are really ideal is for serialization and deserialization. So let me show you a different example that takes advantage of that. So I have here an example that accesses a RESTful web service. The RESTful web service I'm accessing, I guess I should show you, sorry, is the icndb.com service, the Internet Chuck Norris database, the database of Chuck Norris jokes. Chuck Norris once ordered a Big Mac at Burger King and got one, that sort of thing. And what I've done here is to create a service class called joke service that's going to access this. Now I decided to do this one both ways, both with a REST template and with the web client, just to show you could use either one. And in order to make this work, let me go back to this service here. If I go to the API and then I scroll down, you see it's a relatively small JSON response here. I'm going to go down here and invoke the limit to with just the nerdy category to get a random joke because believe me a lot of the others are not suitable for public consumption i'm afraid but this is what the response looks like when chuck norris throws exceptions it's across the room that sort of thing but you see this is very small and therefore easy to model and in Java, I'd need some POJOs or you'd have to use Lombok or something like that. In Kotlin, this is perfect for a couple of data classes, one to hold the value here and one to hold the container. So in my system, what I have here is a class or a file I just called model. And notice I have my data classes here. The joke value has the ID, the joke of the categories, and the joke response has the type and the value in it. The rest of these are for a different demonstration that I also include in there using the Google Geocoder. So now I've got my two data classes for the response. And if I go back to the service now, you'll see here that I can auto wire in a REST template builder and then set a connection timeout and build it or the, or the web client builder. I could set the base URL to include that limit to nerdy. And then when I want to get a joke, I supply a first name and a last name. And again, get for object now has the generic type built into it of joke response. So I just plug in the URL. And once I get back my joke response, I can call get value dot get joke. And that's what it looks like. And that returns the joke itself. Now, I didn't know if I was gonna have time to show this, so I thought I'd demonstrate this now, even though I have other things to talk about. And that is one of the other real selling points of Kotlin. One of the features that people really get excited about is this thing called coroutines. It's the ability to write 
asynchronous code in a way that looks like synchronous code. And that's what I'm doing down here. This one is a call, what they call a suspend function. That means that Kotlin is allowed to suspend it during execution, save the state, go do something else, and then come back and resume it. And that's the asynchronous mechanism. Now, by calling with context with dispatchers IO, what I'm doing is saying, don't use the regular thread pool, the same one that would be used for the user interface, for example, use an IO thread pool, one that gets you off the UI thread. Now, in this particular case, I'm dealing with a RESTful web service. That's not such a big deal. But for anything with a UI in it, that would be very nice. So here, I'm just doing the normal asynchronous call, awaiting the exchange and await by Body returns a joke response. And what I'm injecting that into is a controller here where I get the async response. This time I'm hoping Mark Heckler is around because I'm using him as the default. Uh, and then I can say asynchronously, go ahead and get the joke. So if I actually start up the application here, and I, I already started once earlier, so that should start up reasonably quickly. So there it goes, and it, it added up. And I've added in the actuator, so I can actually go to this endpoint section and look at the mappings, and there's my joke URL. And if I run an HTTP request to that, to that slash joke there, then it should give me back, let's see, Mark Heckler protocol design method has no status request responses, only commands. Eh, I think we can do better. Let's see can overwrite a locked variable. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. Let's try one more. Is hosting is 101% uptime guarantee. Yeah, that, that fits. The, the best I've ever seen out of that database was uh, Mark Heckler can make a method abstract and final, which I thought was pretty good. At any rate, you see how this is all operating asynchronously using these coroutines, and it looks like synchronous code. I do have to warn you, though, just because it's easy to write asynchronous code doesn't make asynchronous coding easy. Okay, I mean, there's still a lot of traps in there, but for something this simple, it's not too much of a problem. All right, now those data classes look great and they're very useful for, as you see, JSON serialization. What they warn you against doing, however, is using them for JPA because JPA just doesn't play nicely with immutable objects. If you want to use the data classes for just straight Spring JDBC or with um, MongoDB or anything like that, they're fine. But JPA is expecting things to be modifiable. So here's an example of an entity that has a class here with some annotations that come from JPA, ID and generated value. And you can see you list the various types as val types if you want, but then this primary key is a var type. It's modifiable and it's nullable. And in fact, you initialize it to null because null means something to JPA. It means it's the object is in a transient state and therefore it doesn't correspond to any row in the database. Also, by the way, the recommendation is to put your nullable variables at the end because when you instantiate this class, you can just leave that one off if it has an initial value being null, something like that. So what I wanna show you over here is I also have an example with this sort of persistence here. Here is my set of domain classes. In Kotlin, enums are called enum class, but they basically have the same behavior as they do in Java. And here's the same thing I was showing, except that I'm using the column annotation to map these properties to first name and last name rather than exactly what they are. I also am using the normal spring mechanism of a schema dot, SQL file and a data.sql file to populate my Starfleet captains here. Uh, Kirk Card, Ben Sisko, Catherine Janeway, Jonathan Archer. I've not put in uh, Christopher Pike or anything yet, but at any rate, there's my database. And one of the neat things is, is that you can make a repository from uh, Spring data the exact same way you would have in Java. The colon in Kotlin is extends in this case. So the officer repository extends JPA repository with the same generic types here. And if I wanted to, I could add mechanisms to say, let's make a function that would be something like find all by, you see IntelliJ is eager to do this, find all by, let's say last uh, like um, 
and rank equals something like that. And then the, this would take a, um, a string. Let's see, so there'd be my like clause of type string and my rank of type, my rank enum here. And you see that automatically gets generated exactly as it would in the Java world as well. So I could go ahead and add this in there if I wanted to. Uh, I didn't, yeah, it's just not updating, but that's all right. Uh, what I also have in here, however, are a couple of tests to illustrate. First of all, uh, JDBC tests, let me use the JDBC, actually here was the JDBC officer DAO, and this one uses the JDBC template. So here I have a row mapper interface implemented with the following Lambda, whose job is simply to take a row in the result set and instantiate an officer out of it. Out of it. And notice that Kotlin has um, named arguments in the constructor, should you choose to use those. Also, if you're familiar with row mapper, you know that the map row method takes a result set and an int. And because I'm not using that int, I can simply put in an underscore as a placeholder to make sure it understands this is the implementation of the map row method, but I don't need that value. And therefore I don't get warnings about unused values or anything like that. Uh, this is just very nice as a mechanism that I could use to convert an individual row into an officer. I've got inserts with simple JDBC inserts and generated key columns and all that. And you can see that if you're familiar with the, the standard JDBC template, this is all very similar to what the JDBC template works. However, here's another place where Spring has added an extension function. Query for object, for example, says, oh, I want back a Boolean. And it takes as an argument, let's see if I mouse over there, the SQL string, any arguments to plug into it, and a function that maps that result set and int into an object. Again, that's the row mapper. So here I'm saying take the result set, get a Boolean out of it. This is just to find out whether something exists by ID or not. That's the basic idea. Okay, so I just have several different implementations of this, a uh, map of with a map, and, and just lots of examples if you wanna see them. Likewise with JPA now, here, this is auto wiring in the entity manager using the persistence context annotation. And this code basically looks exactly like it would look if you were using standard Java implementations. Again, the override method here though is necessary because that's used when you're implementing an interface or overriding a method from the superclass. So basically the same kind of stuff, except that you could write things as single expressions. You could do your casting with the as operator. You could specify classes this way. There's lots of features you can use to make that simpler. And again, I have various tests just to illustrate that everything's working, you can make these transactional, you can auto wire in the features and so on and check that everything's working, getting the IDs. Uh, and also, by the way, is another what of, of what they call a scope function, which basically is used for side effects. So this says instantiate an officer, Lieutenant Uhura here, after that, invoke the save function, which will wind up setting the ID on that officer, because otherwise it would have been a null ID. And then also print some, uh, assert that the ID once you get back is not null. So that way I was able to put in my answers there. So I've got about five minutes to go, just giving you an idea how these things can work together. Notice you get this temptation to do everything all in a single line, <laughs> it just happens a lot. Uh, the reason I didn't use an equal sign here, however, is because J unit tests are supposed to return unit. And this also would return whatever the apply returned, the apply returned the entity and I don't wanna return the entity. So it's easier just to put it inside the braces here. But that's the sort of mechanism used to write the various tests as well. Also, just as an aside, this is a function from the Hamcrest matchers. So I just wanted to make sure that I could use the Hamcrest matchers inside Kotlin, just as I used uh, JUnit. And up here, if you take a look at my imports, in, in Java, that would be a static import. In Kotlin, it just looks like an import of a function, of course, because they don't have static the same way. 
Okay, now back to the slides for a moment. There was a question, by the way, that said, uh, I've been using JPA with Kotlin data classes and seem to be doing this ever since they used Spring Boot with Kotlin. What issues could you run into? You know what, so did I. I started off with the, the data classes as well and I thought they were fine. And in fact, the recommendation came from that tutorial I was telling you about, building web applications with Spring Boot and Kotlin. And if you scroll down in here, so this is one of the guides that's actually available on Spring. So if I scroll down to the persistence with JPA, they do talk about the all open plugin. That's no longer necessary because the, the JPA plugin takes care of that. But here they point out that, uh, where is it that they say, because again, they're using this mechanism with all these var types rather than JPA. Ah, here we go. Here we don't use data classes with val properties because JPA is not designed to work with immutable classes or the methods generate automatically by them. Again, I have not been burned by this, so I don't know what the error would be. I don't know what the danger is there, but I'm following their recommendation just based on I'm assuming they know what they're, they're asking, and I, I'm going to keep up with that and see if anything changes on that later. Uh, again, I mentioned about the coroutines. Again, as a recommendation, they're very popular in Kotlin. They make async calls very easy to write. Of course, that doesn't make async coding easy. The idea here, however, is this is competing with, with reactive streams. This is basically a competitor to the WebFlux module. And right now, I couldn't tell you which one's going to win. I know that in the Android world, so the Android world is probably two years ahead of the server-side world in terms of making use of Kotlin. And in the Android world, they have basically stopped using Rx Java, which they use pretty heavily over there, and switched over to coroutines, especially in library code. It'll be interesting, interesting to see if the Spring people do the same. I do find it reasonably straightforward to use, but then again, I spent all this time coming up to speed on the Web Flux module. I don't want to just give that up either, which is a terrible reason to worry about it. I mean, after all, that's a sunk cost. But in the next year or two, we'll know for sure whether the Spring people wind up preferring to use coroutines or not. Now, there is an example, and I put a link here for you so you can see a suspend function and all that. This is actually from one of the examples online. And let me just give you some conclusions so we could wrap this up. So Kotlin simplifies Java in many ways. I tried to show a handful of them. There are many more. The data classes are convenient for everything else. Uh, whether they're convenient for JPA or not, is that's the question under debate. The extension functions are easy to use. I don't tend to write that many. I do them occasionally. You'll notice in that tutorial, however, they did a couple of nice extension functions for formatting dates and things like that. The reified generic make it simpler. You don't have to go past class references as arguments to methods anymore. The DSLs that Spring make available are very convenient to use. And the coroutines are quite promising, although I would say you can jump in there, but you might want to wait and see what happens. Final thing I'll say is I added in a whole bunch more slides to this slide deck. Uh, just on talking about Kotlin features and more and more, and you're welcome to all that. So as a reminder, the repository is here with all the code in it. I'll be happy to hang out and answer any additional questions. Uh, thank you very much for coming and, and I hope you had a good time.